Thanks, Adam. And again, let me say welcome to you, everyone, on behalf of the Federal Highway Administration and the National Operations Center of Excellence. Um, our topic today, are your signals ready for automated traffic signal performance measures? Um, we've got a pretty good lineup of speakers today. I am your moderator. Um, and having just completed civility and harassment training yesterday, I should be especially polite and cheerful today as I moderate. Um, and as I said, we have seven presenters, so uh, that's a lot for 90 minutes, and we will definitely have to sort of make this the lightning round of webinars. So, so let's get to it. Um, again, so we have coming up speakers from Utah Department of Transportation um, speaking about automated signal performance measures and an open source solution developed by UDOT. Uh, we've got two speakers uh, speaking about the census network solution. Uh, Colin Kenton and Steve Kimball. And then after that, we have live traffic data. Uh, that'll be the city of Danbury, Connecticut, uh, Abdul Berry and Craig Anderson. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with the discussion of the MyoVision solution, and that'll be Pima County, Arizona, and Aaron Simpson with, with MyoVision. Uh, so a word from our sponsor. Um, of course, this has been sponsored by Everyday Count. Everyday Counts is a state-based uh, model that's intended to rapidly deploy proven but underutilized innovation. So automated signal performance measures is the technology in round four. Um, and if you're not familiar with Everyday Counts, I'm going to provide a link on the next slide or maybe the slide after that to give you some information that you can link to for the EDC program. And as Adam mentioned, uh, since we have a pretty tight group of presentations. We may not have time to get to all of your questions, but we've already set up a discussion forum within the Center of Excellence so that we can you know, have some ongoing discussion and address any questions that come up today. Um, you may be wondering, if you're not familiar with Everyday Count, what is it? Is it effective? Well, if you're heard of automated, or excuse me, adaptive signal control technology, ASCT, was a technology that was introduced into Everyday Counts 1. Yes, it had been around since the early 90s, uh, but from 91 to 2009, there were about 40 deployments, and 40% of those were shut off. Uh, we wanted to uh, move this technology to the mainstream status, and so it was EDC 1, 2010-2012, increased deployment on about a rate of 192%. Um, so that, you know, it's pretty effective. That says that a top-down and a bottom-up approach to, in, I guess, promoting innovation has proven to be relatively effective. Again, here are some links. Uh, you won't be able to click on these on your screen, but as I said, we'll pop some of these up into the chat box where you can get access to them. And if you want to learn more about Everyday Count, some of the funding mechanisms that are available, um, some prior webinars if you're not familiar with the basics, because today we're going to get into, you know, are your signals ready for automated signal performance measures? And we've had some prior webinars on the topic of what are automated signal performance measures specifically. Um, there's also a link there to the State Transportation Innovation Council, which is uh, a resource you might use to request a workshop or to learn more about uh, automated signal performance measures in your state and how it's being applied. Um, and then there's also, if you want access to some of the information that Jamie will talk about specifically, uh, there is the open source application development portal. Uh, finally, a word from our sponsor, a disclaimer. Um, it's important to understand that while we are um, sponsoring the workshop, Federal Highway does not, or the U.S. government, for that matter, does not endorse products or manufacturers. So the stuff that you hear today, yes, it's important. It's essential to the objective of the webinar and to the initiative. But we are not endorsing or promoting the use of these products. And we certainly recommend the use of a system engineering analysis or some other systematic process to identify technology selections within uh, your organization. Okay, with that, I am going to, well, this is a slide I'll show later, with access the links to the discussion forum. I'm going to save that. I guess right now we can hand it off to Jamie, and I will give you Jamie's bio. We do that handoff. 
Uh, Jamie is with the Utah Department of Transportation. She has been a statewide signal engineer with UDOT since 2011. Uh, she manages over half of the state's 1,200 signals and has been very instrumental in developing a lot of the metrics um, within Utah's uh, ATS PM um, open source software that's now available within the open source application development portal. Uh, she's worked in SignalOps prior to this uh, for 12 years in both Texas as well as Utah. And she has a bachelor's degree from Iowa State University and a master's degree from the University of Texas in Austin. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Jane. Thanks, Eddie. Um, all right. Well, I'm glad to be here today talking to you guys. Um, I'm a statewide signal engineer for UDOT. We um, developed a performance measurement system about, uh, I don't know, five years ago now when we had a review of our traffic network and decided that we really were missing the boat on a few things. And one of them was, how is our system doing? And we decided, the, the quality improvement team decided that we really needed to monitor our system in a different way than we currently were to really determine that. And so at the same time, we met um, a researcher from Purdue University, Darcy Bullock, and he had a couple concepts ready to go. And we happened to be in the right time at the right place and were able to deploy using the research he had done. So we, um, at the time, looked around. And nobody provided a software or a process to do this. And so we decided to do it ourselves. And so this is our website. You can use that link right there and visit it yourself. It was really important to us to not have firewalls, to not have passwords to, to access the data. And we found it to be well worth our investment. And it's, it's been really great for us to feel like we're contributing back to the industry a little bit as well. The website's pretty simple to use. I'll explain how it works here. So you just pick a signal number, if you know it, or from the map, you can select it. If you're looking for a certain metric, you can filter by that metric. And the, the map will filter. You pick a metric type. There's some options on the right side there. You pick a date and a time and hit Create Chart. And the website will generate. There's also some links at the top that have links to uh, those Purdue enumerations I just showed you, a couple of other reports, previous um, presentations that UDOT staff has given. Uh, so feel free to go look at our website and let me know if you have any questions. Uh, as Eddie mentioned, you can also get the source code for the software on the OSADP website. The website's itsforge.net. And um, we, we put it up there as open source uh, last year. We're already on our current version, uh, an upgrade on the, on the website. Version 4.0.1 is the current one. And we're, we're very interested in having others contribute back to the software. So if that's something that you're interested in, let us know ahead of time so that we can coordinate with our developers to make sure that it'll be compatible. Um, I believe there are about 21 installations of our software so far in the country. We're, finding, we're hearing more all the time. Uh, you don't necessarily need to talk to us to download it. So sometimes we find people have been using it for a while without us even knowing. So that's, that's pretty cool. Here's the basic concept. It's taking an automated data collection system and turning it into useful information about performance. So our major source right now is the traffic signal controller. But there's also probe data sources um, that you could use to get maybe an additional metric. The basic concept is why model what you can measure? Why estimate what you can know? And you know, with the the purpose of reducing some of that and uncertainty and unrisk and risk in your network. This is the basic architecture. It starts really with the traffic signal controller that collects and stores that data. And then and it's data about whether the signal's red, yellow, green, the detection actuations, the pedestrian actuations, priority calls, preemption calls, what plan is running. Uh, you name it, it's probably in there. The traffic signal logs that data at a tenth of a second. That's what it's called high resolution data. And then we retrieve the data occasionally from that traffic signal controller approximately every 15 minutes. And we store it on the database server. And then it's easily accessible from our website. These are the components that you need to have, your, to have a system like this. 
you need a way to log the data. And so we use a, high, a, a controller that's capable of high resolution data logging. A way to communicate or get that data back from the controller, a server to store the data on, some software, and optionally for different metrics you can have detection. It does not require a central traffic management software to run. We have a central system. We love it, we use it a lot, but this data, this data side of the traffic signal and analytics is separate from that. So they're, they're very complementary systems, but it's not required that you have a central system. Another goal of uh, the Purdue concept is to have vendor neutrality. And so the, those Purdue enumerations that, that they put out um, are, are kind of like a standard and the idea is that all the controllers will use that same standard and so you can take the data from any controller and throw it in the big data bucket, and you won't be able to know from the, the front side uh, what, what controller it is. And it'll just give you a great um, universal look at how that signal is operating. In UDOT, we were really lucky when, when the system came out, because we already had really great calm to a lot of our traffic signals. We currently have about 90 of the state-owned signals connected, and with a goal of getting to 100% statewide, including our partners in the next couple of years. If, even if you don't have COM, though, you can use the system. Um, there's this Raspberry Pi device, which, if you're familiar with it, is a Linux processor, essentially a mini computer. And that's this little black box you see attached to the controller here, um, a cheap GPS antenna. And suddenly, your controller will know the correct time. And you can put the as big of an SD card that, as you want in that Raspberry Pi device and collect and store all of that data. And then you do have to retrieve the data, but we visit our, our sites at least once a year. And even with that, if you bring the data back, you can, you can get a good glimpse of how that signal is operating. This is our estimated cost of implementing the UDOT ATSPM system. Uh, we haven't really provided any feedback on this, so use it with a grain of salt. Obviously, getting controllers or a, a way to log the, the, to log the data is, is a first step, and then finding a way to bring that data back. Those are kind of unknowns in this. But overall, all you're really paying for is a server and a license to use the SQL database. And then optionally, if you want, you can hire an IT consultant to install the software and an engineering consultant to configure your system and detection. So it's a relatively cheap option um, for, for many systems or for many agencies to get up and running with without a huge upfront investment. So let's move to the fun stuff. These are some of the metrics and detection that's required so that this is to give you an idea of, of you know, how prepared you might be to, to start with this already. So on the right here is a list of all the metrics available. And on the left are the detection requirements to get those metrics back. So the good news is that top part requires no detection. This data comes back automatically from any signal set up on the website. Um, the, the top two there, the phase termination chart and the split monitor, I'm going to show you some examples of. And I chose those two because, one, they don't require any detection. So they're available everywhere. But I also feel like they're the two most important metrics. And they're the ones that we use the most often. Um, the lane by lane or lane group presence detection, that's generally what you already have at your stop bar. There's a really great metric called the Purdue split failure that gives you an excellent idea of when you may be over capacity or not and whether or not you can reallocate some of the split time around your intersection. We have a sensor that provides, um, allows us to do count sensors right at the stop bar and with that you can get turning movement counts. And then if you have an advanced sensor uh, that can count, you know, we use approximately 400 feet behind the stop bar. There's a whole slew of um, metrics you can get from that, including the Purdue coordination diagram and with that the Purdue link pivot. This is what our full detection setup looks like. So we have stop bar um, in every through or left lane around the intersection. We have those advanced counts on the main line only. And then at the stop bar you can see we have little uh, count zones as well. So we don't have this at every signal. And so the this, this system is really great that you can kind of customize it to what you're ready for and what you want to invest in. And you can 
upgrade detection if you want. If, if you're not capable of getting some of the metrics, you can always install or upgrade, but we generally don't put in new detection just to receive this data. Uh, maybe if there's a couple of holes missing in a, in, a, in a long corridor we might, but generally we use what we have. So this is a phase termination chart, and I'll just explain this one in depth and then we'll move on. So the bottom axis is midnight to midnight. The vertical axis is the phase number, and phases uh, one through eight are at this signal. And then every time that phase serves, it records the termination uh, method. So a green means a gap out, means it did not use all of its split. The red is a max out that generally happens during free operation. A force off is using 100% of its time during coordination. If there's, uh, I forgot I had this. If there's a gap, that means it's skipped. And then the little orange dots above the line are the pedestrian activation. So we can look at this pretty clearly. We see that it runs free from midnight to 6 a.m. and then a couple patterns throughout the day, the day, and then 9 to midnight it runs free again. Phases 2 and 6 are coordinated phases, as you can see with the pedestrian uh, phase that comes on automatically every cycle. So this is, um, I have a couple examples of here how we use this for troubleshooting, and this is probably one of the biggest benefits to us is, is this efficient allocation of resources. So we used to get a complaint a lot that people would call in about an experience they had at 2 in the morning when they expected to be the only ones on the road and they really don't expect to see a lot of red lights. And the call would come in saying, I drove down the road and this red light came up and it hung on the side streets for 40 seconds and it was really annoying because nobody was there and I, and I left and I looked behind me and, it, and the signal's red again and it's been happening for over a month and I'm, I'm pretty frustrated about it and it would be nice if you guys could get your act together. And so then, not knowing anything about it, I dispatch a technician who may not find a problem at all and then he closes the work order and he's kind of upset that I wasted his time and then nothing actually gets resolved. So now I look at the data and this is that phase termination chart again. And it's pretty easy to see here in the middle of the night uh, that phases four and seven are maxing out. Those are side streets, uh, movements to us. They would very rarely max out during free in the middle of the night. And so now I can look at this and I can tell my technician it's only happening in the middle, at, in the middle of the night. It's these two phases. Now he knows exactly what to look for. And you can see why when he showed up at noon that he didn't see a problem because the traffic signal was working just fine. And so now we really quickly get to that this is a video detection problem and the street light probably isn't working. <clears throat> and then we can evaluate the problem, you know, the, the solution. And for us, it was replacing the detection. And as you can see in this chart, we can follow up later and verify that phases four and seven are operating just fine in the middle of the night. So another complaint um, is that there was a really long line of cars. The left turn time was really, really short. And it happened in the PM peak. So in the past, I may have dispatched a timing technician to the site to see if there was enough split time for that movement. He would say, you know, it's like 20, 25 seconds. It should be plenty of time. He, in turn, dispatches a, de a maintenance technician who's going to look at the detection. And so now I've sent two people out there to look, and neither one may find a problem. And again, the problem is just going to continue. With the data, so this is called the split monitor. And now there's one chart per phase. So the bottom is midnight to midnight. And the vertical axis on the left is the split time that the phase was active um, every cycle. And then the colored dots indicate whether it gapped out, maxed out, or forced off. So now I look at this and I can confirm exactly what the guy said. Yep, it is a short green time in the PM peak. The split time, that orange bar is programmed at about 22, 23 seconds. So we're not even using 100% of our split time. <clears throat> Maybe it's a detection problem, so maybe I dispatch, um, I know now exactly which technician to dispatch, but then also um, now I can look at it and, and say, you know, maybe there's something else wrong. I look in the controller, I find that the passage time was incorrect, and I fix it remotely, and I can come back later and verify that it worked. So one other way that the system is really great is in optimizing signals. So my career before starting with UDOT was as a consultant and doing signal op optimization for agencies. And the process was that I paid someone else to collect the data, and from that data we found out we got a, a rough time of day schedule ready. 
We took the data, put it in a model. The model told us the cycle length splits offset. We put the optimized timings in the field, implemented and fine-tuned it, and if it wasn't right, we just kind of tweaked it a little bit, and by then the budget was up and we moved on. With performance measures, we don't collect any data really at all. We might use what the system collects automatically, but we can see from the system what the splits are running. We can see where the problems are, and so we spend some time in the field. We drive up and down the corridor. We get a sense of how that cycle length is doing. We get a sense of where the problem areas are, where the left turns are backing up. And we combine that with the performance measures. We still use a model with really accurate travel times to generate some offsets, optimize timings in the field. And if it doesn't work, that process was so quick to get through that sometimes we'll just start right over and try a totally new concept. And then my consultants are told not to complete the project until they feel really comfortable that the timing is great. So one, one example that can be um, fixed easily is or addressed really quickly is how many pedestrian actuations are we having on each phase. We have really long ped times here and like to oversize our peds is what we call that, where the split won't cover it. And then the signal goes into transition. So if you do this where you have a lot of peds, it can be a really bad thing. So you can see the signal on the left has you know roughly 20 peds an hour. That's quite high. The one on the right has very few on the side streets. And so I, I ask my consultants not to ask me for my opinion anymore when we can go to the data and know exactly what would be appropriate. Um, a great benefit of the system are the alerts that we get. This is really taking us into the proactive signal maintenance. <clears throat> we have um, five alerts, and I'm going to show you two of them right here. We get a daily email in the morning, and then we go through all the signals and double check uh, the metrics to see exactly how it's performing. So this is uh, the too many max outs alarm, and this is a phase termination chart with a day and a half. You can see everything looks fine for the first morning. And the second morning, you can see that uh, 11 a.m. the day before, phase four started a constant call. We evaluate between 1 and 5 a.m. We see that a phase has 100% max outs, and it, had, it didn't have any yesterday. We, we send an email with that phase in the email at 7 a.m., and by 9 a.m., we've made a work order. We do the same thing with the PEDs. You can see phase six PEDs started a constant call. We evaluate it from 1 to 5. It gets included in an email. And hopefully we get out there and fix it before anybody even knows. Uh, one word of warning is to get your technicians ready. We found we had a huge increase in the number of work orders now that we could really see what our system was doing. And getting your technicians on board and behind your system is really important because, um, I don't know about you, but ours, ours uh, feel very strongly about things. And if they're not behind it, it's not going to happen. So after a couple years, we, we said, you know, has this been helping or not? And so we had a focus group to ask the public, how do you feel about UDOT? How do you feel about traffic signals? And then they had these funny little emotion cards to hold up with how they felt about it. And they came back and said, you know, we like UDOT. You guys are really innovative. We can tell you're trying to help us. Traffic signals seem to be getting better. But maybe you should tell us about it. And that was great feedback to hear from the public, that we're so happy with you. You should spend some time letting us know how hard you're trying. So we made this cool little commercial. Uh, that we showed in movie theaters during the trailer part at the beginning. And I'm not going to show it, but you can see the link right there. And I've included it on this site, too, with some more information about how to uh, view our website and, and how to get to – there's a couple forums out there already with people who are using our, our website or, or using other performance measures websites as well. And that's it. Thanks, Jamie. Great presentation. Uh, for those that think, hey, these presentations are moving along pretty fast, um, think about uh, coordinating with your state DOT and the EDC coordinator in your state to request a workshop. Uh, we can spend a lot more time, um, definitely can answer more questions, and there will be additional webinars uh, in the series that we've planned. So we'll have about one webinar per quarter. So keeping the, the lightning round moving along, I'm going to introduce our next group of presenters. Uh, they will be talking about the implementation of signal performance measures in Beaufort County, uh, specifically sense metrics. Um, and for our, our first presenter is Colin Kenton with Beaufort County, South Carolina. He is the Director of Traffic and Transportation Engineering with Beaufort County, South Carolina. He's been there for, or he has over 25 years of experience um, in a number of aspects of signal operations, design operations. Um, our second presenter will be Steve Campbell with Sense Networks. 
He is based in Northern Virginia and is the Director of Symptometrics Strategic Business Unit. So I'm going to leave it at that because these bios are posted in the announcement for the webinar. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Colin. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Colin Kenton with Hubert County, South Carolina. And uh, just want to, we're going to cover briefly uh, just our experience um, in implementing uh, traffic signal performance measures here in Beaufort County. We're, we're kind of in the beginnings of this and uh, going through some of the, uh, how we came about getting where we're at. Um, so just to give you a little bit of area of our uh, Beaver County, we're a coastal uh, community. Uh, we're, we're fairly small. Uh, county, probably 175,000 people. Uh, we've got three large military bases uh, that uh, bring in a lot of uh, employees. And uh, this is just showing a kind of a map of our where our signals are and, um, and some of our data collection locations. We've got a uh, corridor that's under construction now with uh, seven signals that's kind of circled here. And then we've got our uh, a test location uh, where we've got sense metrics installed. Just give you a little history. Um, our department was actually formed only in 2005, so we're a young department. And at that time, we had 40 signals. Uh, but now we've we've more than doubled the number of signals we have, uh, and that's just the example of the growth we're experiencing here. Uh, we've now got eight uh, coordinated corridors. We've got a traffic response corridor. And uh, with the uh, Sense Metrics and Census Network, we have a uh, countywide traffic data management system. Just to kind of give you a brief on some of our traffic fluctuations that we have, as I said, we, we are a coastal community. We're low-lying, located between Savannah, Georgia, and in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, we have a lot of summer vacation tourist traffic. Uh, we were home to Hilton Head Island, uh, Fripp and Honey Islands, and historic downtown Beaufort. So we have uh, week-long beach traffic. We have weekend tourist traffic. Um, but also we have the Paris Island Marine Recruit Depot. And so every Thursday and Friday, we have influx of families coming to watch their, uh, their children graduate from uh, basic training in, in the Marine Corps. Uh, so we, we do have a number of uh, different timing plans for, to serve our summer traffic and our weekend traffic. Uh, we also have special timing plans for the Thanksgiving and winter holidays. And occasionally we do have some uh, some significant storms and we've got to evacuate people. So we have timing plans for that too. So uh, being a small area, uh, we have uh, small staff. Uh, besides myself, we've got our uh, signal systems engineer and uh, and three signal technicians for these uh, 85 signals we have. Um, we, we've been pretty aggressive in uh, networking our traffic signals. We're about 80% countywide right now. Uh, primarily, we use least fiber and dark fiber. Uh, we do have a number of cellular modems, and we're using point-to-point uh, -point radios to uh, improve our networking. Um, most of our signals now have uh, Ethernet switches in their cabinets. And uh, we use a central-based software to manage our, our, our signal system. Um, we also uh, have the census networks for our data management uh, and emergency preemption and PTC cameras. As um, far as traffic system performance measure needs, uh, in identifying where we wanted to go with that, we wanted something that was definitely scalable. Uh, we wanted to be able to start small and, and expand it. Uh, it had to be obviously cost effective because we're a small community and don't have a whole lot of um, financial resources. Um, wanted to be able to uh, identify a solution that would work seamlessly with our signal detection and signal system, uh, provide some very simple reporting options, um, utilize uh, the minimum staffing uh, that we have available and, and um, uh, work both locally uh, as a server-based and or uh, on the cloud. So looking more in depth on the scalable, um, you know, we've, we've got a lot of um, 
isolated intersections out there, and we wanted to be able to implement it out there, uh, but with the understanding that as the high growth that we're experiencing, we know some of the small in isolated intersections are going to be part of uh, larger coordinated systems within just a, a year or two away. Uh, so we do have a number of large uh, high volume corridors uh, carrying, you know, 40 to 60,000 cars a day. Um, and and uh, we want to be able to minimize um, the number of devices and, and what everything going into the signal cabinets. Um, because obviously we've got our, uh, just a few technicians and we've got to be able to uh, maximize their time uh, and minimize, um, you know, specific uh, demands on them on maintenance. Um, and then also it would, you know, something that would simplify the uh, system management. Um, looking into the, our data needs, uh, we all obviously want to be able to collect uh, traffic turning volumes. Uh, we want to be able to identify arrivals on green and arrivals on red. Um, de you know, download the phase timings, uh, identify delays, measure those delays, um, have vehicle and corridor average speeds, but also we want to be able to get uh, on our corridors and our system travel times and origin destination data. Um, so we not only see this as a signal system tool to optimize our signals, but uh, use that as a planning tool in identifying growth patterns and uh, where we need to go into the future. So we do have a test location. Uh, this is a got a picture of the intersection. This is um, at the foot of a bridge and at the end of a, a long coordinated system. Uh, we use the census networks implementation at this location. And I I want to say I think we have about 45 uh, detectors installed at this intersection. Um, we use it uh, presently to collect turning movement volumes. Uh, we adjust our signal coordination based on the data receiving from it. Uh, we can quickly identify spikes and delays uh, by time of day or day of week. Uh, and uh, we use it quite frequently then to retime those signals. Um, looking into the future, as I mentioned early on, uh, we do have our Boundary Street Corridor project. This is a uh, Tiger Grant funded project. Uh, it's only a mile and a half long, uh, but we do have seven traffic signals on this corridor. Um, and uh, with the growth in traffic, you know, we're carrying during the, uh, the Paris Island graduations on Thursdays and Fridays, we're upwards of 40,000 cars a day on this corridor. So it's a very busy corridor, uh, a lot of commercial development, uh, pedestrian and bike traffic uh, is, is growing on the corridor. And so we, we're going to implement a, an adaptive system on there, but also we're including with SenseMetrics the automated traffic signal performance measures. And um, so that will include the, the census pucks um, from anywhere from 35 to 40 of those at each of those seven intersections, plus uh, Wi-Fi detection as part of the system for travel time and origin destination. And in addition to that, uh, we have a movable bridge um, because we are a coastal community and have a lot of water. So we've got a movable bridge uh, that opens regularly for boat traffic, and when it opens, it creates a significant amount of vehicle delays. So we're looking to expand our system to uh, assist us with uh, the travel times and delay management in routing traffic around the bridge uh, when it is open to traffic. Um, so that's pretty much the, the quick and dirty on uh, where we're going with our uh, system. And uh, now I'll turn it over to Steve Kimball. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you, Colin. Good intro. So, yes, uh, here at Census Networks, we've been around in the industry for you know over 10 years now. Um, many are familiar with the, the solution as a wireless sensor, or frequently known as uh, the wireless pucks. But um, we've kind of taken the next step and gone from um, you know implementations like Collins, where our detection is feeding his adaptive system he was talking about, or could be. Uh, but then also using those that same infrastructure and those pucks to then measure his system in addition, right? So giving the uh, detection inputs to his controller and then pulling um, data back into a server um, using this sense metrics uh, product to then measure his actual implementation. So yeah, similar to what Jamie had shown, and thanks Jamie for kind of teeing up um, the background on uh, performance measures and Eddie as well. Um, I'm just going to kind of run with our the sense metric solution and how it's uh, unique. And I uh, eventually get into also showing a live system as well. Figured it would be good to kind of actually show the data in action. But uh, you'll see similar to what Jamie had, um, the sensors uh, for our solution are at the stop bar in red. Um, as well as advanced detection in green. And then um, for our solution, we actually have the detection on the, the receiving lanes or departing lanes. Um, so to get all of the reporting that I'll show you today, you do need this uh, level of detection. But uh, keep in mind, again, like in Colin's case, these detection uh, or these sensors can also be tied into your traffic controllers, uh, giving standard advanced detection or stop bar detection as well. Um, so another unique thing about census and why uh, our solution is a, a bit different than some of like what uh, Utah had developed. Uh, of course, census is a detection manufacturer, so we've got um, the raw data rather than um, pulling the data out of the, the cabinet and the controller. We've got the raw detection and exact timestamp uh, data from each sensor. So we kind of really got that as a, 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 a data set directly from our system. And then we actually pulled the phase data from the controller um, using you know, different methods for uh, NEMA-based controllers and cabinets or versus Caltrans cabinets. So uh, anyway, right, this, this solution is ready for um, any, pretty much any uh, intersection agencies may have. Here's a list of some of what uh, the reports and data that come out of SenseMetrics. I'm not going to hit all these, but um, one of the things that's at least uh, somewhat unique to our architecture, and because we have those exact timestamps, are the turning movement counts. And Colin was talking about not only being able to find anomalies in his system and identify those, but then have the data to then go out and retime and actually um, do something. So he, he has discrete turning movement counts, 24-7, 365, um, including in shared lanes. So um, I think a lot of you guys are familiar with a lot of these metrics, and we'll show some of them in the live demo. But uh, some additional differentiators, um, sense metrics, as I said, is, is kind of based on um, it's it's why it's different is because of that high quality data and those exact timestamps from the sensors. So uh, you've got that high accuracy, but it also comes um, packaged uh, with monitoring and preservation services. So um, all these systems are really only as good as the detection and data that's being fed into them. Uh, we, we kind of combine it uh, and package it with um, the ability to monitor and then go out and fix any problems. We also aggregate the data a little bit differently than most uh, reports are, um, and we can also set up alerts on any of those reports, but uh, we've got it set up where um, the data can be looked at in averages, medians, or 80th percentile type of things, uh, where you can really quickly see any changes in your network. It's also a single server architecture where some solutions require multiple servers. Um, it is a little more simple um, with options for cloud-based and virtual servers. Um, again, we already talked about 24, 7, 365 discrete turning movement reports. Um, and then also it is part of a suite. So uh, full 
a full solution that Colin was talking about, including Wi-Fi data, um, that is all kind of part of that same um, solution suite set. So I will go ahead and pull up the live system. This is uh, that test intersection that Colin was talking about in Beaufort. Um, we also have, you know, kind of standard reporting on volume, occupancy, speed. Each element in the system has diagnostics, and you can see any problems with a particular sensor or repeater. But um, I want to show you quickly uh, turning movement report. I can um, do canned, canned reports on any of these and save the actual report. Like, uh, we're running slow here. So um, you can slice and dice this data, like I said, um, and aggregate it, average, median, 80th percentile, any specific movement you want. But I'm going to go ahead and run this uh, actually for a year of data. Um, I'll show this while that's running the screen. Um, this is actually all of Colin's data from the um, beginning of the system. It was actually installed in 2014. But you can see some of, uh, this is total traffic volumes. You can see some of what Colin was talking about. Uh, heavier traffic in the summer months and spring. Um, and then also I think Colin said that there was a um, construction event that caused push a lot of traffic to this particular intersection. You can see that and we will show some uh, comparison reports. Um, as well as you can see there was actually a hurricane that affected the system that was down for a while in October. But um, you can see that these reports I could pull out the October data. Um, so for instance I could pull it out out October here. Um, here's total volumes by month for um, the intersection. I could do per day of week. And then uh, most importantly, uh, by movement. I can see every movement. I can zero in on a particular time of day and then export that to Synchro Ready, um, UTDF format. Uh, let me show. Now, uh, performance measures start with uh, capacity, volume to capacity, capacity ratio. You can see on um, his phase six, um, you know, so this is actually, about, by the way, about a week of data. His phase six, he's got a peak. He can go in and look at that phase six for that week and maybe even zero down, down on a particular uh, movement uh, with an issue uh, by time of day. Um, or day of week. This is just weekdays. Um, some other examples are um, another data available. Percent arrival on green, wait times, uh, red light violations. You can get into safety metrics. Let's look at um, a heat map. This is a heat map of percent arrivals on green throughout the day. You can see the darker colors um, are higher percentages. So kind of in his off peaks, he's got some better arrivals and, you know, um, I guess he, it's probably more interesting um, by movement here. I know northbound and southbound is actually coordinated. Um, here's a comparison report that was interesting. We ran it before and then after um, that construction project that Colin was talking about. And you can see clearly um, the blue shaded area is kind of the added load on um, criteria two after the construction. Um, by day of week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you, you see his loads um, are added here now after the construction. He's getting more traffic there. He can quickly look at that and maybe even slice and dice it by um, specific approach or um, time of year. And I also wanted to show the last kind of report here. Um, I know we do this a little bit differently. We, we do label it as a Purdue coordination diagram. but. Um, this is actually a different customer or uh, agency, but uh, this green shaded area on this particular um, intersection, we, we've got eastbound and westbound here. Um, the report is for a week of data, and um, this is a 120-second cycle here on the x-axis. And then um, <coughs> green shaded area is percent probability within that, um, that cycle that the eastbound phase is green. So from uh, time zero to 64, it is green. It gives the side street um, some time, and then it goes back. Um, and these the sloped areas for early return to green. Um, but the, the shaded area is for that week. These are the actual arrivals, right? So if you look at this east westbound here, you've got um, platoons showing up um, in the in the cycle, and um, you know maybe 
this particular agency can see a dip here, and this is probably where they really want to service that side street. So um, they're actually looking at uh, potentially moving and shifting some of these offsets um, and changing their, their coordination along the, the corridor. And of course, they can then go back and once the change is made, measure it again. Some of what Jamie was talking about, actually taking a look at um, if your change has worked. So um, with that, I just want to give you guys a flavor of um, an actual live system here. Um, I think, uh, pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you, Steve. You are right on time. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, learning a lot about uh, different solutions, and I hope everyone keep in mind that you know we've heard two of probably more than twelve potential solutions for how you might implement automated signal performance measures. Um, and so definitely consider your organization capability and certainly a systematic process like system engineering to help you select a system. Okay, so uh, continuing with, the, I guess, the next, next set of presentations, uh, we have presenters uh, representing Danbury, Connecticut. I'm not sure that uh, Abdul Muhammad was able to get on the line. So I'm assuming that Craig will probably provide his presentation for him. So let me introduce Craig Anderson with live traffic data. Uh, Craig is the product and business, business development manager for live traffic data. Uh, he's worked in the ITS market for over 25 years and has a great deal of patience because he formerly served on the US DOT Joint Committee for Development of the NTCIP uh, ITS protocol. Um, and uh, he has a master's degree in physics and is a member of ITE and IEEE. Turning it over to you, Craig. Thank you, Eddie. <clears throat> I apologize on behalf of Abdul. He was unable to join the, uh, the webinar, and I only hope that I can uh, represent uh, Danbury on his behalf and uh, apologize for any uh, misstatements that I may have. Um, Danbury uh, started in... Uh, to pilot the what we call SIGPAT for Signal Performance Analysis Toolbox uh, several years ago uh, in Danbury. Um, he, he's, here's some information on the city. It's a fairly uh, well-established city. It's been around and uh, had a population of 85,000. It's one of the uh, fastest growing uh, cities in, in Connecticut at this point in time, uh, 44 three square miles in size and uh, right on the border of, of uh, the state of New York it's about 65 miles from, from New York City. Um, the traffic signal infrastructure uh, consists of signalized intersections within the city. Uh, 70 of those are connected on fiber, and then 10 of those intersections are not uh, at, this, at this time. Uh, they have a, no, a different uh, uh, distribution of uh, controller types between 70 and 170s. Uh, their central system software is primarily uh, CompuTrans uh, on about 55 intersections at the time, and uh, the city is slowly migrating to Centrax. They have about 15 uh, intersections using Centrax uh, central system software at this time. And as we stated, 70 of those signals are now connected to, uh, to Central. Um, Danbury uses both uh, stop bar and advanced detectors uh, at, uh, at the intersections uh, on this corridor. Uh, the city's primary objectives are to maintain a good state of signal operations and timing and coordination as well as a good state of uh, maintenance of the assets. Uh, they dedicate 25% uh, of their staff time to routine evaluation and enhancement of traffic flow operations and about 35% of their staff time on proactive upgrades and, uh, and maintenance of, uh, of assets. Uh, the city experienced thus far with uh, performance measures uh, they've they've uh, been provided with a cost-effective and efficient way of meeting the primary goal of traffic efficiency. Um, it's uh, enabled them to eliminate floating car runs uh, along the corridor and physical field monitoring and data collection along the corridor to which it's deployed because they can access the uh, information on the arterial remotely from uh, from their office. It facilitates uh, easy identification of deficiency and in intersection time uh, and uh, uh, as well as coordination and therefore triggers and for uh, re-evaluations that are intended uh, needed for optimization. And as uh, Abdul says, it's become the watchdog of their operations. Uh, this is a, 
<clears throat> an overview from the uh, performance analysis box uh, web-based software uh, of the uh, corridor seven intersections. Uh, I'm here it's the uh, intersections of each color with a level of service. Uh, a and B is green, uh, C and B is yellow, and so on. Um, and then the link between are color coded with the um, <clears throat> the link certainly being experienced at those approach to those intersections. Green being some sectors of light vehicle, yellow between uh, 20 and, and 55 and seconds and so on uh, per vehicle delay. This is a, a quick look at one of the intersections. This is a very fair mall uh, main entrance uh, here this intersection. Uh, there's a, a Google small inset Google map to show you the, uh, the location. And we've simply plotted here in this uh, uh, westbound approach here uh, three of the uh, detectors on the approach, uh, one in the left turn lane, that's the lower uh, main count here, detector number one, and then uh, detector three is the through movement. And most of the cars running right into the uh, into the mall and you, in the is when most of the uh, right turn lanes are turning into, into the mall at that particular point in time. We've also plotted out arrivals on green for that approach as well. Uh, to the right here is a list of all of the features that are enabled uh, in, in the uh, uh, SIGPAC software uh, from queue lengths, max queue length, total delays, saturation level, uh, number of stops, volumes, green duration, uh, arrival on green, uh, a PCB Purdue coordination diagram, saturation flow rates, throw speeds, and there's uh, pedestrian uh, uh, signals and, uh, and push buttons and preemption information that's available also. Uh, the conclusion then on, on the, from band areas, the uh, goal is to expand deployment of SIGPAT along other corridors, especially as uh, arterial detectors are, are installed and they can get the benefit of explaining queue lengths and uh, uh, delays. And they want to share their experience, already are sharing their experience with others in the area on the benefits of uh, using performance measures as an analytical tool for development of uh, traffic operations. So. Uh, a business development manager with live traffic data. Um, we have a very interesting uh, business model. Uh, we have kind of two uh, arenas that we work in. One is obtaining the data, and uh, shown on the left, uh, <coughs> advanced uh, traffic performance measure tools for public agencies to adjust the traffic signal timing and de de decrease uh, travel time on the signalized ar arterials. And we provide this at, at no cost to the agency. And uh, on the other side, we bridge the gap to the connected vehicle uh, uh, arena. A lot of vehicles already have communications, whether it's cellular, radio, or satellite communications. And one of our, uh, one thing we uh, intend to achieve is enabling vehicles to use, take advantage of uh, signal performance measures and, and uh, signalized data from the intersections to improve the driving experience, to make it more efficient, and, uh, and hopefully uh, help with safety as well. And we also want to use that data uh, to provide and enable uh, smart city applications where that signal data may be used for, for other, other purposes. Uh, just a quick history of the development. Uh, the technology behind our, our, uh, our solution was developed in the early 2000s at the University of Minnesota. And uh, <clears throat> the, the company has grown. We started rolling out nationally in August of 2014. And expanding our installations nationally uh, uh, rapidly in the, uh, the SIGPAT uh, uh, software. This is a uh, architecture quick overview of our system is uh, is together uh, within an agency's uh, firewall, whether it's a city, county, or DOT. Uh, we have uh, provided local server here. We can either provide the hardware or software on an existing server, and we communicate the uh, the uh, controllers at the intersection in a variety of means. Uh, we have the uh, ability of, of uh, in cases, getting the uh, intersection signal data uh, from the central software system. And if the controllers are running NTCIP or AB 3418 standard communication protocols, uh, we uh, can pull directly and get the data right from the controllers. 
And then as uh, Jane talked earlier, uh, the Purdue solution was to develop data logs in, in some of the newer controllers that have that capability, and we can retrieve those high resolution data logs directly from the controllers as well. And then uh, this last solution is more of a hardware solution, and this uh, enables us to get uh, high resolution data at uns what I call unsupported uh, cabinets where there, there isn't uh, NTCIP or maybe uh, maybe no central software talking to the systems and, and not no ability of logging the data on a data logger. Uh, so we, we're talking older, older, more traditional control that are out there and probably have a long life yet. And we're able to use this hardware box that goes in the cabinet and it can get the signal and detector data. So useful for the computation of, of the uh, performance measures. We push that data uh, up into the cloud then and uh, in a cloud-based data server store the performance measures we're doing. We have our performance measure uh, web server software and we connect to that uh, through a normal web browser. We recommend uh, the Chrome web browser uh, either from within the agency firewall or outside uh, moving around and uh, consulting engineers that are working with these uh, transportation agencies uh, have access to that, again, at, uh, at no charge as well uh, for that, uh, no monthly fees for the, for the data for the performance measures. So that's the basic architecture. It's uh, easily scalable and uh, uh, can handle and is very quick and, and robust because we're using existing service uh, uh, systems. Uh, this is just a, a quick look at our, our hardware that we have. Um, as I mentioned, we can con connect all controller types with that. Um, we have that uh, capability of any, any controllers of the major manufacturers, and we support all detector types. We're basically agnostic when it comes to controllers and uh, detector types. Um, we've had uh, this using this hardware has been deployed since 2007, back before a lot of the uh, capabilities today were available and, uh, and still, still operating today. This is a, a quick look at some of the features from, uh, from our uh, signal performance analysis toolbox. Uh, plotting volumes here, comparing uh, a weekend to a weekday. Uh, we can plot, among other uh, performance measures, max Q length, total delays, average delays, volumes, green duration of arrival on green, Purdue coordination diagrams. And we also have some arterial performance measures, such as uh, time-space diagrams. We can do uh, uh, green band analysis if there are no detectors uh, available on the corridor. Uh, we can do uh, vehicle trajectories, which allow us to enable uh, travel, uh, estimate travel times on the, uh, the roadway as, as well. Um, on the right-hand side here, a uh, arterial uh, <coughs> uh, congestion report, kind of a heat map, if you will. Uh, we show here on the left 10 eastbound intersections, and on the right the same intersections westbound from 5 in the morning till 6 p.m., and we've color-coded the delay here so that the, this is the average delay per vehicle at the intersection uh, in 15 periods uh, throughout the day. And this can be averaged over the course of a week or the course of a month. So the, uh, the dark green is less than 10 seconds of delay per vehicle. And the dark red is uh, uh, greater than 80 seconds of delay <clears throat> per vehicle. And you can quickly look at this to see which, uh, which intersections and which times of day the congestion occurs to uh, very quickly focus in on where in arterial you may want to put your efforts into uh, making some improvement and adjusting signal timing. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is near my final slide here, but just some of the benefits to the agency. We're very budget friendly because we, uh, we can provide um, both the software and the hardware and support at, at no cost to the agency. Um, we facilitate regional sharing of the uh, ATSPMs uh, for signal synchronization or other traffic engineering projects as well. And we can enable the smart use of existing signal infrastructure. We don't require uh, your agency to upgrade controller equipment. We don't require you to revise your detector uh, configurations. And it's a matter of uh, a way to provide uh, what infrastructure to vehicle communications now and there's a lot of uh, great work that's coming along. It's going to take some years to, to deploy, but we would like to help accelerate that infrastructure to vehicle communications. And I mentioned uh, enabling smart city applications using the, uh, the data throughout uh, the network of a, of a city to enable um, <clears throat> uh, vehicles and fleets uh, uh, to maneuver smartly through the, through the city's network and uh, help the economy. 
Um, we automate the signal performance monitoring fine tune, and we have the capability of real-time alerts. No one has time to sit and look at this uh, data uh, all the time, so we can provide exception reports and periodic reports of the uh, of the data. And at the right is just a list of the various um, uh, performance measures that that we provide. So the, the title of this webinar is, Are Your Traffic Signals Ready for Automated Traffic Signal Performance Measures? And I think from what you've seen uh, from these presentations so far is, yes, uh, they are. And I think the real question is, I'd like to turn it around and say, are you ready for automated traffic signal performance measures? And uh, I'm sure Eddie would encourage you to look into any of the systems that are being presented here this afternoon. With that, I'll hand it back to, uh, to Eddie. Thanks, Steve, and I, I like the way you tied that together um, at the end because we have heard, you know, at this point now we've had uh, three different solutions offered for implementation. Um, there's the open source approach provided by Jamie, uh, then we heard from Colin and Steve, since metrics, and then live traffic data certainly offers, um, you know, a unique architecture, a number of options, and, you know, the cost. Of virtually free is, is definitely compelling. Um, so, you know, again, you know, we're going at these pretty fast, sort of a lightning round approach to the webinar. Um, there are workshops planned. The next workshop we have planned is in San Francisco on August 7th. Uh, you will see that appear on the National Operations Center of Excellence calendar probably by the end of the week. Um, and there will also be another webinar expanding this topic. We're going to look specifically at funding and um, approaches to implementation, maybe look at some other um, private sector solutions in addition to the ones we've heard today. So I encourage you to, if you haven't already done so, to sign up for the NOCOE as well as potentially going on to the Everyday Counts website and um, you know, joining and getting access to the newsletter that comes out um, pretty much monthly. All right, so let's move on to our next uh, set of speakers, our final set of speakers, actually. Um, so we're going to, the next presentation is going to discuss implementation of automated signal performance measures in Pima County, Arizona. The uh, presentation will be provided by Michelle Mont Montagnino. I hope I said that right, Michelle. Uh, Michelle has 17 <laughs> years of experience in traffic uh, across both the public and private sector. Um, she's involved in pretty much all, that in, excuse me, all aspects of traffic engineering from design through construct, to construction and transportation operations. Uh, she's a registered professional engineer in Arizona and a PTOE. And discussing the myovision uh, solution will be Eric Skimson. Uh, Aaron is the MyoVision Director of ITS Product Marketing. She's been there for over two years and draws on 15 years of experience in technology, marketing, innovation, and management. Um, and she certainly does that work to help cities and states, and i got to mention provinces because she's actually based in, uh, in Canada. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Michelle, and look forward to hearing your presentation. Hi, it's Erin, actually. I'm going to just give a really brief intro, and then we're going to turn it over to, um, to Michelle. So okay. welcome, everybody, and thank you very much, Eddie, for having us. So I think the, the first place that we want to start today is looking at um, sort of reviewing what are the benefits of performance measures. And this is a fantastic um, example that was presented to us by um, Dr. Ayrton Coles, who works for the University of Tennessee at their Transportation Research Center. He, and he equated it to a Fitbit for your traffic signals, and I thought this was brilliant. This is a feedback loop that enables you to collect some really fantastic data, gives you a really good way of uh, being able to view that data, and then think about, well, what are the objectives I'm trying to achieve? And through that feedback loop, you're able to understand, like through your traffic signal system, are we doing the right thing in order to achieve the objectives that we've set out to do? Um, and I think, you know, Jamie certainly talked about that. Um, what UDOT's been able to do over five years is to focus on where are the most critical issues, what is it we want to achieve, and then getting everybody on board to do that. So I just think this is, um, you know, this is a, a context that we all understand well, and it, it resonated well. So let's talk about what are the challenges of actually arriving here, because it certainly seems like a logical system. But there are really two parts um, that we've identified. And this is through talking to hundreds of customers. We've identified these same challenges 
all the time is that there's a technical hump you've got to get over in order to adopt um, to adopt ATS PMs. And so this, you know, it's a little bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you don't have at the baseline communications and the ability to access all of the data from your equipment in the field to communicate that securely, to make sure you've got some way to visualize that data, and then and analysis tools, really, um, you know, you're not able to reach that carry on the top of being able to do optimization. And the challenge that we've heard from many customers is saying, my God, I've got to, I've got to solve all of these challenges before I can even try ATS PMs. And so getting over that technical bump is certainly, that's, um, that's a consideration. The second thing is, um, is now we've got to use it, and I think, if I go back to what Craig just said, is are you ready to adopt this? And you've got to think about, well, if the action, this data is not actionable, I've got to learn how to read these charts. I have to think about interpreting them. In the meantime, I saw people calling and complaining. Um, I, I've got to justify this purchase and this investment to my boss or to my funding agency, and I'm having a hard time understanding it. And I would argue that's probably even a larger um, challenge that agencies are going to have to overcome in order to adopt a system that's going to enable ATS PM. And so when MyoVision started looking at this opportunity in the market, we've thought, we've talked with a lot of customers and thought a lot about what are the challenges that are being presented and how can we design a system that helps you overcome those challenges and get to um, a quick and steady adoption of this system. And so, again, this is um, sort of a stack like Maslow's Higher Kidney. It's at the base, being able to acquire the data from all of your infrastructure and not having to build new infrastructure or replace what you already have, but connecting with what you've already got communicating that securely somewhere that's going to be able to store petabytes and petabytes of data over the long term. So you've got access to that data to be able to go back, do retrospective studies, do comparative analysis. Um, that's an important piece. From there, you, know, you want to have to be able to have day-to-day -day management through monitoring and alerts. And so we've got a system called Spectrum Signals that offers that. But really, this is all in service to the highest function, which is about delivering insights and being able to understand from a trend perspective, looking at comparative um, measures over periods of time, actually acting on this data and being able to say, hey, did this actually improve what we wanted it to or do we have to go back and start again? Um, and so the stack is really meant to overcome both those challenges. And so it's, it's a system that delivers the technical aspects of what's needed, but also delivers the data in a very actionable and accessible manner. Um, has a number of dashboards that highlight your priority issues and enable you to think about what are the measures I should be using to dig into where I see the current issues in the system are. Um, we have a, a great support team that's here to, to um, work with anybody who wants to try using new measures. And we've got um, direct agency to vendor relationships because we want to be close to customers to understand what are you experiencing, what's going well, and what's challenging. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle now. and. Um, Michelle's going to talk about how Pima used this system to help with some of their challenges. I think I just, Craig, I don't know if, or, um, if I can turn it over. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can. Yeah, we just gave Michelle access. She should have it up Thank in a second. Thank you. Can you see me? <laughs> um, so, Just to give you a little bit of background information, um, Pima County currently has 105 traffic signals and 16 hawks. Of those, um, 104 of the intersections are equipped with communication um, back to our central management system. Um, the ITS staff consists of a section manager, a civil engineering assistant, and myself. Unfortunately, signal timing is not only a portion of what we are responsible for, so we don't get to give it as much attention as we would like. We are always looking for new ways to leverage our time more efficiently and saw that opportunity with the MyoVision solution. We first tried MyoVision as a communication solution for a remote intersection we could not get tied into our existing wireless network. This gave us an opportunity to preview the information Insights had to offer. We saw the potential of Insights to assist us in the traffic management um, during the upcoming I-10 interchange closure of Einer Road. This is a major interchange on the northwest side of Tucson, and we knew the closure would have major impacts on the adjacent roadway network, but didn't have a good way of quantifying those changes. We hired a contractor to install the MyoVision equipment at four of our intersections along Ina Road at Camino de la Tierra, Shannon, La Choya, and La Cañada. Um, the only upgrade that we did was we upgraded our controllers from ASC2 to Cobalt. This wasn't required, but was part of an overall um, upgrade that we're doing throughout the county. 
Um, the installation was completed in just one day, and the system was installed about a week before construction, which allowed us to get some good before construction data. Using insights, we were able to look at the before-after condition of the origin destination patterns and visualize the impacts of the interchange closure on traffic. As you can see from these diagrams, before the closure, traffic originating at La Cañada would go all the way through the corridor exiting at North Camina de la Tierra, presumably into the town of Marana. Um, after the closure, the traffic only went as far as La Troya Boulevard. Um, it would be, have been nice to be able to get more detailed origin destination information with deployment um, to additional intersections to the north and south, um, but budget constraints did not make that possible at the time. Cortero Farms Road, which is the major arterial north of Ina, is the official detour route for Ina Road. A roadway widening project on Cortero Farms is scheduled to begin construction this fall. We are curious to see what additional changes will be evident in the origin destination patterns when local traffic patterns shift once again to accommodate construction. A few weeks after the closure, once drivers had a chance to adjust to their new travel patterns, we went out to adjust signal timing. We increased the cycle length from 120 to 150 seconds, and we changed coordination at the La Choya and La Canada intersections to, um, from east-west to the north-south to help funnel traffic to alternate routes. One of the insights we found particularly helpful in evaluating sig signal operation was the split trend analysis. The red route bar represents cycles with unserved demand, meaning not all the vehicles in the queue were served during the cycle. As you can see in the graphs on this slide, the split failures northbound at La Cunada did not have a huge change after the closure, with only a slight increase in split failures during the AM and midday peak. After implementation of the new signal timing, we were able to eliminate most of the split failures in the northbound direction. In fact, we can see where there are several instances of spare capacity, which is represented by the blue areas. Um, we have subsequently been able to go back to the intersection and fine-tune the timing, providing additional time to other movements, which we're still experiencing some split failures. The arrival on Red Insights was another exhibit that showed um, the benefits of the new signal timing. It allowed us to look at the improved reduction in arrivals on Red in peak hours when signals were operating in coordination. As you can see by the increased screen on the graph, there was a significant change in peak hours, particularly in the PM peak. This was a big deal for us to go to 150 second cycles. The county had never exceeded 120 second cycles, and there was a bit of skepticism. This chart helped us justify the change and show that lengthening the cycle length was a good decision. Insights also provides a due coordination diagram that allows us to look at the individual vehicle arrival relative to the green phase in each given direction. As you can see, the adjustments in signal timing and offsets during the peak hour coordination significantly improve the arrivals during green, and perhaps there is some opportunity to improve it a little bit more. It has also given us a much better visual of the platooning of vehicles. As we exhibit in the diagram, we can achieve much better platooning in the PM peak right through here than we are achieving in the morning. Insights um, can also be used to look at the effect of um, timing changes on travel time. One of the things that we were cautioned about with going with a longer cycle was it may improve intersection efficiency but can have a detrimental effect on the corridor travel time. As you can see from the before-after comparison, the timing changes have had very little effect on median travel time. Thus, we concluded the timing adjustments to improve efficiency at the intersection level did not come at the expense of the overall corridor operation. Even though we only have a small deployment of the MyoVision system, we can already see the operational benefits in our daily activities. Before MyoVision, we would have spent hours each day at the intersections observing traffic during the peak hours, trying to account for changes in traffic pattern and adjusting signal splits. With the information gathered and analyzed through Insights, I have that information readily available and can evaluate peak hour operation at any time of day. We can periodically check on signal operation and be more proactive in our signal optimization. The system offers real-time monitoring of the system and allows us to do some diagnostic evaluations even without leaving the office. In addition to monitoring the signal controller, it can also provide us alerts about the battery backup system, 
which is a feature not currently available through our central signal management system. Another great feature um, is the ability to turn back time uh, and look at what, exactly what the signal controller was doing at any given time in the past. This has been helpful when looking into complaint calls and can be evaluated from the office. We can look and tell that the signal short cycled at a time of day complaint because of a vehicle emergency preemption or identify some intermittent problems such as stuck push buttons. Um, our current system, we have to use a VPN to gain access to our central management system and PTZ camera system. But with the MyoVision, it's a web-based interface which allows accessibility from anywhere, which is a nice benefit um, to us from when responding to emergency calls after hours. Uh, one of the things I was uh, most impressed about with the MyoVision solution is how easy it was to set up and use. For us, it was pretty much a plug-and-play operation. We provided MyoVision with basic signal configuration information, and they provided the system um, to pull the data correctly from the controller. The Insight dashboard is very intuitive and easy to use, which has made it easy to incorporate into our daily workflow. Um, we are hoping that next fiscal year we'll be able to have the opportunity to expand the system um, to other arterials. I will now turn it back over to Erin for a wrap up. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, it's been really oh, it's been really fun to work with Pima on this project, and I think it's been um, you know an opportunity for us to to see the system in action in a really real construction um, situation. And, and it's, you know, it's been as fun for us to see what are the results and what did you expect and then what did we actually see. So thanks very much for sharing that story. So I think one of the, the things that, um, as we've been working with, with cities, we understand that there are really, there are different layers of data that make <coughs> the entire view or the full picture quite important. And so if you start at the intersection level, all the unique information that comes from the individual detectors or the preemption or from um, phase timing becomes really important information to understand what exactly is happening at a particular intersection. Are, you know, is my, my infrastructure working well? Do I have issues that I need to clear up? Before you start coordinating between intersections, you want to know that that unique intersection is working. But, you know, one intersection in and of itself is not going to tell you a whole lot. So if you're able to take that unique intersection and overlay travel time, um, on that aggregated intersection data, it gives you a great corridor view. And from there, that's interesting, but again, one corridor in and of itself is not going to tell you the whole story. So as Michelle said, being able to have um, a broad enough distribution within the network to be able to pull information from a wide variety of, um, of the intersections tells you an awful lot about what's happening at the overall level. So getting that origin destination inter information aggregated with the corridor and the intersection view provides an excellent place to start. So for instance, um, we've started to build tools that, that help you look at a more aggregated view, at a higher level view, at that 30,000 foot view to say what's happening in my network, where are the issues that I need to be dealing with given the objectives that we've set as an organization. And so starting with the view something like origin destination, you begin to appreciate what travel patterns are we seeing, where are cars going, if there's an incident, what is the normal detour that they might take. Do we want to reroute that detour in order to make sure that we're increasing efficiency, ensuring safety of neighborhoods, things like that? And so, um, you know, that becomes a really important view into where are the, the biggest challenges. When you go from a network analysis, um, you can start to go down and look then along a particular arterial. And this is the corridor heat map that we've developed. So this is, um, we've seen a heat map previously. This is a bit different because what you're looking along um, the north-south are the, are different intersections. The space between the intersections is actually relative to the actual space between the intersections. And what we're looking at here is the travel time. So a blue travel time would indicate free flow when you're, you know, running through the intersection in the middle of the night. And as the colors change sort of from the yellow to the orange, you're looking at um, a multiple of that free flow time. And so you can see in the, you know, generally in the afternoon, you've got some increased travel time along those corridors. This is an interesting one you can see at the top end, in particular, between the 401 and Eagle Street, there's quite a dark band um, on the southbound. And the interesting part there is that this is actually intentional. So you've got cars that are being marshaled in this area coming off of a really um, busy freeway. They're being marshaled here so that they can then be platooned down the corridor. So that's quite intentional. So it helps you also say, are we actually achieving the intentions that we've set up here? Now, when you've got a six times um, travel time, multiple, you might say, geez, I hope we're not backing up onto the freeway. So you've got to make sure, you know, within the parameters you've set, are we actually achieving what we want? 
but um, you begin to see very clearly, um, you know, what, where are the benefits and where are the challenges. A second way that you can look at that is to look at, well, what does the arrival on red look like, not just at one intersection, but actually in bidirectionally and by intersection. And again, this gives you a better overall view to say, well, I know I've got issues along this particular corridor, but where along that corridor? I don't want to have to go and run specific reports at every single intersection. Where's the overview that tells me I need to be looking closely at a couple of intersections? So you can see in the south bound, you'd probably be looking at the Pine Bush and maybe at Bishop, and north bound, it might be actually Sheldon Road and Hub 401 that you're looking at. So again, how can I use this tool to point me in the right direction? Not to say this is a deluge of data that I now need to sort through to figure out where are the issues in the system, but how can the system actually help me uncover where I should be focusing? And this is another um, another way to visualize that information. So you could start to look to say, okay, if I if I need an overall report, or I've got the mayor or councillor saying we always have issues at this, this intersection. Why is the travel time going up? Or why is why are we having so many issues? You actually can dig deep into the information and provide quantitative reports to say, look, we've actually Im improved travel time, or yeah, we've seen a decrease, but we know that this is because of whatever, seasonality or construction or a new hospital opening. Um, but being able to pull these report cards in real time means you could actually have this information delivered to your mayors or councillors or folks that need to be making public statements about the performance of the system on a really regular basis. So from there, we also have a whole set of individual signal performance metrics. And many of these have already been presented today. Um, but I think that you know, the story is you've got high-level metrics. You can then start to look at a more, um, in a little more specified way at the 10,000 foot view along an arterial. And then you've got a number of metrics you can use them to dig in at individual intersections when you discover that those are things you need to look at. Um, from a signal analysis perspective, we've talked about this, um, that certainly real-time alerts are important. You're not sitting at your computer watching what's happening day in, day out. And so being able to receive alerts both on a mobile device as well as a computer is important. Technicians are out and about in the field. If they can catch an alert in real time and get that fixed, that saves everybody money and time. Um, and beyond that, you're able to, in real time, have a look to say, geez, when there's an issue like a detector failing, What's going on there? Can I get somebody there? And how is that affecting my um, my performance? And you can zone in on that. And so this, you know, this is one way that you might investigate and, and respond to citizen complaints in real time. In fact, Michelle shared a story about that. That she's um, she had some citizen complaints calling in to say they were they said they were waiting three cycles. She was able to look to say no, they weren't actually waiting three cycles. It probably felt like three cycles, but it wasn't actually three cycles. And so that ability to respond in real time to customer complaints saves an awful lot of time and headache of having to go digging through um, old files or reports to figure out what's going on. So we've talked a lot about how do we leverage existing infrastructure or the infrastructure that we're using in the field. So um, my vision has a camera called the Camera 360. It's a fisheye lens. And a couple of things that we're able to do that would contribute to um, overall performance measures, things like being able to capture turning movement counts. And you can order those directly from um, the, the signal system. So 24-7, 365, you know, over the Christmas holiday or Easter weekend when you can't find anybody to go out and, and do counts, you're able to do that no remotely from a camera. Um, there's a high level of accuracy, and this includes pet and bike, for instance. And that just gets delivered directly to your system, that report, so you've got easy access to that information um, in a very short period of time. Beyond that, the camera is now being used to do some detect video detection. And so being able to, again, leverage existing existing um, equipment in the field to do now detection. And we've noted that detection is a really key piece of being able to do ATS PMs. So leveraging the camera system to do um, further ATS PMs becomes you know, a really good way of efficiently um, and in a, a less expensive way being able to build more, um, more activity into your intersection. And finally, we've had some mention about this. This is a, a really exciting, sexy um, topic in the, the market right now, is what's happening with connected cars and certainly vehicle to infrastructure, as Craig said, infrastructure to vehicle communication is an exciting topic. And so the, um, the SmartLink device and the SmartLink antenna have the SRC functionality built in. And so being able to turn that on and prepare your transportation infrastructure already today by implementing this stuff for tomorrow's communication needs um, is key. And so we're, we're going to be running pilots within cities with this shortly, and we'd um, be thrilled to talk to you about that opportunity. 
And finally, I think, you know, with one solution, Spectrum is able to help agencies overcome a number of the challenges that we talked about and really get to experiencing the values of using signal performance measures to optimize your system. And we'd be thrilled to talk to you about that um, at any time. You can find more information, information at this website, and please don't um, hesitate to reach out and contact us for a conversation. And I will turn it now back over to Adam. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, I'll take it back. Uh, thank you, Aaron and Michelle. Um, um, you know, it's so rare that someone with, uh, that goes last actually has uh, extra time. So it's great that they were able to get it in. And thanks to all the presenters that were able to, uh, to get through their presentations. Um, for our last slide, I wanted to put up the question and discussion form just in case we don't have time to get your question in. We do have time for about maybe three questions. Um, so let's sort of address those. But before we wrap it up, I wanted to uh, say that so we talked about are your signals ready for performance measures? We probably didn't talk a lot about why, although we heard that throughout several of them. But just to be very uh, direct about it, I think what we've heard today is signal performance measures is a way to operationalize an objectives and performance-based approach to managing your traffic signal system, uh, operations, maintenance, and certainly provides an opportunity to improve safety, reliability, and the uh, um, mobility of, of your signal system. Um, and just to add to Aaron's uh, Fitbit analogy, uh, think about it this way. Would you drive a car that doesn't have a dashboard or a speedometer? All right, so with that, I'm going to wrap it up, and I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. I think we have about maybe five questions and just under maybe two minutes to go. So let's see how many of those we can get to. We'll go over a little bit as we get through those, and then we'll, um, as I said, if you've got a question we can't get to, please post it in the forum. Thanks, Eddie. Hi, everybody. This is Adam. Again, um, just a quick reminder before we go through these questions. Um, we apologize that we know some of your colleagues were left out of the webinar today, um, but we'll send out a uh, recording of this webinar uh, later this afternoon uh, so that everybody can view it. Um, so a, a couple quick questions, um, well, two specifically for Craig, um, I believe, that came in. Um, to what extent has the deployment of performance-ready intersections reduced the number and severity of crashes and increased mobility? And uh, what metrics have you have you have been useful in, in that in performance overall? Yeah, thank you for the uh, the question. I don't don't have an answer to that. We don't uh, haven't done a correlation with uh, deployment with uh, with crashes at this point. So quick Thanks answer. so much, Craig. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and that, that's probably a topic that's good for the discussion forum that um, that Eddie posted up there and that we'll send out um, as well uh, to, to continue discussion about that, about what other jurisdictions are doing. Um, and then a, a question for um, uh, for Jamie that came in early in the presentation. Um, will what you discussed work with Caltrans 2070? Do you know, do you know at all? Hi, um, thanks for the question. I'm I'm not sure if you, that's, you really need to work with your manufacturer to see if your controller is capable of logging that data. Okay, great. And then a, a couple other of, of notes on, on detection types and uh, uh, other ideas that came in. We'll post those um, on the discussion forum uh, to keep the conversation moving. So um, I, I'm going to wrap up here. I, I want to thank Eddie and, and all of our presenters um, so much for, for their fantastic presentations. Thank you, everybody who joined us today. Uh, look for the, the recording to come out um, very soon. And feel free to share uh, with as many people as possible. And uh, we'll continue this discussion on the no-code discussion forums and uh, look forward to more similar presentations. So thank you to Eddie and, and everybody else. Have a great day.